Another thing when we talk about market is that market are really, really good in reallocation water in scarcity to, for instance, where water markets in Australia have really helped rural communities and farmers is when droughts have been really, really, really bad. Say 20, 30 percent of your normal water supply. Well, if you're a, a wine grower or, or you have a horticulture, permanent planting, right? You are in strife, right? Because the stuff dies. It's not just like if you grow wheat and then you say, oh, well, that'll be wheat next year, right? If you don't irrigate your permanent plantings, your losses are significantly big, right? So where the reason that the horticultural and viticultural industries in the Maritime Basin in Australia have not suffered more than they have is that most of the water in the basin is actually applied to irrigate sheep, right? Uh, which is among the lowest value uses you can think of. Right? And hence, when there is a drought, irrigators who want to keep their wines and their peach trees and almond trees and olive groves and other things alive are willing to pay a high price for not seeing their plantings die, for not losing next year's crop. Whereas the cost of a wheat grower, of not to grow any wheat, is very low. So say a wheat grower can maybe make $50, $60 a metric megaliter, a million liters, I guess. Um, whereas in some of the years where this has been really bad, the price has been $500 to use a megaliter for one season. So instead of going out there and work hard and grow wheat and earn 50 bucks, they can actually sell the same water for 500 bucks. That's 10 times as much. So you say your allocation is only 10%, you are still making as much money as if you have grown wheat with all your water. Right? And that's very, very helpful, both for the irrigators who normally produce little value, but also for the high value irrigators. So the balance between low value commodities and high value commodities based on permanent planting is a very important balance. If you are committing all your water to permanent plantings, you have no flexibility in the system the day something really bad happens. So the bit that Okanagan has a fairly high reliance on permanent planting is a further challenge. I just had a chat with John before we started, and I understand that there's actually a fair bit up north in Okanagan Valley that are relatively uh, pastures and annual crops. Another thing that I think is maybe not unique, but it's important for Okanagan, and that is the very different water uses, the agriculture, and then the growing importance of recreation, lifestyle living, uh, retirement, people from Vancouver, all the oil that flows in from Alberta, or at least the money derived from the oil that comes into a, into into Okanagan for people who want to live here because of the nice climate, good wine, nice food, all the same reason that, that you all live here, I guess. Uh, so there is an increase in conflict, and it's interesting to find a balance between that, because why do people want to come? Because there's nice vineyard, nice fresh fruit, nice clean water in the rivers and, and other things. If we suddenly take all that water out of agriculture and put up a whole lot of retirement villages and resorts and other things, and then all the vineyards disappear, well, all the stuff that people actually want to come and enjoy is then disappearing. Right? On the other hand, the guys who have the vineyards, they really like all these tourists coming in because if all the vineyards was going to sell the wine in the stores in Toronto, right, it wouldn't get nearly as profitable. Right? So there's an interesting balance of economic and social interest in the valley that I think is something that you need to consider. So I think based on the previous slide and these um, other factors about Okanagan, I think it is likely that Okanagan will face real scarcity. That means that Okanagan and the people living here have to make some um, hard decisions about how to deal with scarcity uh, in the, I wouldn't say the long term, I would say the medium term. So what we need really to deal with scarcity is what we in Australia call a robust institutional framework, which means a system 
that can handle scarcity. That means a system under which the rules are set so everybody knows the day of scarcity comes along or the years it comes along, there is set rules for how this is going to be handled. Who is going to carry the burden? How is the burden being shared? How much water is going to be retained in agriculture? How much is needed for other things? These are things that the, an adaptive framework means. It also means that you're in climate change if that is going to happen. And under increased economic growth, increased population, we cannot have a static system because things might change. And that means the institution needs to build into it a capacity to change. Right? That's what is meant by a robust system. So when you have scarcity, then you reach the point where it doesn't matter how many letters you send to the minister, he's not going to give you any new license. Right? There will be a, what you call a closure of the basin. Australia closed in the 60s, 70s, and 80s in different states. Southern part of Alberta are now closed the basin. It means no more new allocations. So if somebody come in with an offer to build a new potato processing plant, to process more high-value potatoes, to create more jobs, and they say, hey, um, you near a city in here, I need some water to come, uh, potatoes takes water. And they say, sorry, I don't have any water, right? unless you are in the city water supply. So therefore, you need reallocation mechanisms. Right? Also, if you have soils that are not really that suitable to be irrigated, we need to be able to move it. Right? If we need more water in the rivers for the environment, we need to be able to move the water. Right? So reallocation mechanisms is necessary. And one of those are markets. Markets are not the only reallocation mechanism. Politicians have very draconian rights. They can change the laws. They can say, well, from 2011, we hereby grant uh, the minister the right to redistribute whatever water you have. And I will say to you, you are a bad farmer. Sorry, no more water. John, here's a really good farmer. You get more water next year. Right? How many politicians like to do that? But if there's any politicians in the room, can you raise your fingers? You'll be happy to do that. It's not a popular thing to do. Hence, market mechanisms, water markets, are looked upon as the most viable ways of taking hard political decisions with respect to water. Why is that so? Because it's a voluntary deal, right? Here's a buyer, here's a seller. The buyer believes he's better off after I pay the seller. The seller believes after receiving the money that he's better off. In principle, both of them are equally happy. And therefore, no politician with egg in their face. It's a very important thing. Uh, it's a good job to be a politician. It's well paid, good pension, and all that kind of stuff. You don't want to lose it. So what to do? Well, the first thing I would do is I would do as much as I can. What is viable? What is politically feasible? It is said that uh, groups like your own, for instance, and politicians and idea makers should lead from the front. Right? But my advice is always, just make sure you, get fur you do not get further out in front than people behind you because they'll see you, right? Because in the end of the day, it only helps to be out in the front if you actually have everybody else with you, right? So that's what I mean, do what is optimally viable. Know that water reform is an um, interim process. It's an iterative process. You cannot do everything at the same time. What I think is very important is that we develop some what I call uh, adaptive planning processes. As I said before, and which is clear in the Okanagan, that there is a lot of economic interest, a lot of stakeholders that all gain benefits from water. It is important that all of these stakeholders is integrally involved in figuring out how we're going to resolve this. 